I'm going to warn you, and I hope I don't offend anybody. I use the word moron in this episode, but we talk about a really smart topic and I've got a smart guest. He's David Stern. He's the CEO of Boston IVF. He worked at Serono, Serono USA, ran Serono Global. Uh, he's worked in other areas of healthcare. He is an MBA. And so we talk about the Boston IVF model. And I challenge a bit on how much different from private equity is it. And David gives his answers. We talk about private equity. We talk about the the debt burden that is placed on the businesses purchased and not the limited partners and not the private equity firms. We talk about the obligations of servicing such debt what that usually means for younger partners trying to buy in. Uh, We talk about what people that are exiting fertility practices need to know when they're selling at a price and the conditions that are placed for earning part of that money. We talk about buying and holding practices and uh, the benefits and the pros and cons of that, and should younger people be doing that? And then we you give some details of how Boston IVF buys practices, and uh, and and their model. And so again, I'm not the I'm I, I I'm I'm neutral on private equity, at least kind of. I don't know yet. Uh, I'm still investigating this whole thing, and it's obviously not one brush, uh, but David gives uh, good insights. And so I'm going to re-listen to this episode and uh, I hope you really enjoy it. And I'm sorry if you are someone that has given up their home, the title to their home and left your name on the mortgage. And I called you a moron. I haven't been in your shoes. I apologize. Please don't be offended. Please enjoy the show. Mr. Stern, David, welcome to Inside Reproductive Health. Thanks, Griffin. Pleasure to be with you today. There's probably uh, 10 or 20 topics that we could have covered given your experience. But uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on is because you had a talk recently at the Midwest Reproductive Symposium in Chicago. And uh, you talked about some of the challenges that private equity backed uh, companies can face. Um, You are the CEO, as the audience knows by now, of Boston IVF, and you have a a bit of a different model. We can talk about that later in the show, but can we start with what was the frame, the framework for your talk and what are the challenges that you see of of, uh, private equity backed companies? Or we we could even do pros and cons if you want to start that way. Well, I, I, Griffin, the, the original, inter, uh, I guess, imitation from Angie and, and the Midwest Reproductive Society was just to come talk about private equity, because there's been a lot of activity in reproductive medicine over the last really three, four years, a little bit before the pandemic. And then since the pandemic, we've seen a huge growth in private equity coming into this space. And uh, so they wanted to have a, somebody talk about it, whether there's, you know, their pros or cons. And I tried to approach it in, in a very um, open way. Uh, yeah, Boston IVF has a different model. Uh, we're not private equity, but I didn't want to come in and just have it be framed around our lens of how we look at the field, but really trying to take a step back, look at the, the bigger aspect. And first off, understanding the difference between venture capital and private equity, because I think a lot of people, especially physicians, they use the term interchangeably and and they're not interchangeable terms. Yeah. Uh, I've talked about that on the show too. I mean, and and I, I'll have you review my definition because I know that there's some overlap, but uh, private equity generally uh, purchasing existing businesses, uh, generally taking a controlling stake in the company, generally looking to sell within three to seven years uh, at a higher multiple, either by reducing costs, increasing profit, both, um, and funded by limited partners, where venture capital also funded by limited partners, but generally 
purchasing or, or investing in companies at a non-controlling stake that are uh, nascent and they are hoping to scale and then sell out at a much larger profit. Is that is that, that a is a perfect recap? perfect de- definition, a perfect recap of them and the differences. I've worked for venture capital backed companies in women's healthcare, and generally speaking. They are making a, a minority investment early stage and looking to help grow the business. Whereas private equity, as you said, is coming in to an existing business that's already generating profit and making an investment at a majority ownership stake. Um, and their goal is then to be able to maybe make the, the company more efficient, uh, be able to drive growth in profit and then flip it. And so absolutely, you know, they're looking to be able to sell it at several times what they've bought it in a short period of time and then provide those uh, returns back to their investors. And that's why uh, they position themselves as a better investment option than just the normal stock market where maybe you get a 10% return in a good year. Um, They're looking at uh, multiples of that much higher return, but also higher risk. I want to talk about those multiples too. When I, when I when I try to explain the overlap to people, I can't necessarily explain the overlap, but what I tell people is watch Shark Tank because it's normally a venture capital move, but every once in a while, they make a private equity play and you can actually see it in real time where Kevin O'Leary will just say, yeah, yeah like I like <laughs> your company. It's make I don't want this product that you're trying to get me to invest VC. I want your company and I think it would be better if I was running it. I'll give you... Uh, you know, I'll give you this much money for this person. So you can actually see where venture capital and, and private equity converge. Uh, and I do want to talk about um, what they what they do to increase those multiples. So let's start with some of that uh, efficiency. What is it the what is the efficiency that private equity uh, you know purports to bring or aims to to bring? Well, first and foremost, I think that's part of the pros. The pros of private equity is that they are typically operating multiple businesses in different fields. Uh, sometimes you know you have healthcare private equity that also have some a dry good manufacturer or from a manufacturing company or, or or some other things, and so they're not specific to fertility or even healthcare in general. Um, and they have people who are very good operators. Uh, these are people that know how to run businesses. Again, they might not have any reproductive endocrinology experience. They might not have any healthcare experience. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But that's one of the benefits that they bring is they know how to um, operationalize a business. So they can improve the efficiencies of the practices. They can bring back office improvements, uh, maybe in how financing is done or reporting, uh, customer relationship management, maybe under a centralized electronic medical record. They also provide resources for growth. Um, and, And so from that standpoint, those are some of the benefits that a private equity can bring. So when Richard Groberg was on our show, who is, uh, uh, you know, he's been the, the fractional CFO for companies before he's helped different practices buy in and uh, or buy back their practices from groups. He's helped them sell to groups. In his view, uh, he doesn't think that the networks so far have been successful in bringing that efficiency to bear. What do you think? I think... Um, I would agree with Richard for the most part. I, I believe an outlier is Prelude. I think Prelude has done a very good job at streamlining their network where all the, from my understanding, and you know, you'd have to talk to G- TJ directly, but my understanding is that they're all utilizing um, an electronic medical record for their group. They're utilizing an app for patients. And what they focused on is using technology and infrastructure from an IT standpoint to improve the overall patient experience and probably also improve the back office uh, operations of their clinics. And and so I do think that they have done a good job with that. Uh, You could probably, I think U.S. Fertility offers some of that as well from from an uh, IT standpoint. Obviously, they have an electronic medical record. Uh, They have some marketing um, and... um, 
you know, some other programs that I think they offer. But some of the other networks, I would question whether they've brought the value uh, to the IVF centers that they've bought. Well, half of the rest of the ones have been open for, have been around for six months. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, just, does, it does seem like that. And there's a new one popping up all the time. That's what I mean. There's always a new one. And, and I, I had uh, um, some the 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 ladies that run uh, Rescripted on and we were talking about the venture capital stuff. And I said, I'm I'm not the jury. The market is the jury. And uh, and only t- only time will tell of, of all of these things. I, and in many cases, I'm not qualified to even analyze someone's business at that level. But it seems uh, that at least many have not been able to uh, provide that efficiency. And so why do you suppose that that is? I think IVF is still a very local business. And what I mean by that is IVF is complex. It's not easy. When you're running a dental practice, I think a dental practice is is relatively easy or or, um, another area of LASIK. You know, some of these areas that uh, are some of these industries that private equity have gone into in healthcare is much more cookie cutter. And those can be approached in a very similar way. IVF has so much complexity because just looking at how is it being reimbursed? Are you in a state that has uh, insurance mandate? And when you're in an insurance mandated state, you have to practice differently than when you're in a state where patients are paying out of pocket. You can be a lot more, um, I would say, you can have a lot more staff. You, there, there's a lot more uh, room for uh, expenses because the patients are paying out of pocket at a high amount um, and you can still make a very good margin. When insurance is paying, you're already getting significantly discounted on what your fees are. And so you have to do a better job of being efficient in a practice. And so, for example, in a Mas- in a Massachusetts where we have insurance coverage, we can't afford to have physicians do ultrasounds. We have ultrasonographers that do it. So the physicians can spend their time seeing patients because that's what's generating more revenue is bringing more patients into the practice, not having a physician do an ultrasound. But if you're in a smaller boutique IVF center in a cash state, the doctors feel like it's actually a benefit to do the ultrasound because they get to see the patient every day and they talk to the patient. And it's a way to add some additional bedside manner to the patient. And, And that might work very well for that type of practice. I want to talk about that efficiency with insurance that you talked about, because this seems like it should be an argument for but potentially being part of a network, being part of a, a better group. I just did an episode with on this with Holly Hutchison from Reproductive Health Center in Tucson and, and the direction that employer benefits companies and insurance companies are going. But I, I posed the, the, the thought that was actually posed to me by a client that it is better. You have more leverage being having more of a certain market than being a part of a, a larger network. So let's say we're, you know, let's just say that we're in New York and uh, and we're a part of a big company uh, you know, where we could be part of the biggest uh, fertility company in America, but we only have three docs out of, I don't know how many are in New York, 40 or 50 probably. And so uh, we only have three docs of those 40 or 50. And so they actually don't really have the leverage. Despite being part of the biggest company, they don't have the leverage, whereas a group that maybe they're not a part of any network, but they're in a market that has 16 REIs and they've got 13 of them, that that's where the leverage is. What do you think? Oh, I totally agree with that. I think Shady Grove is a great example. Shady Grove owns the Maryland, DC, Virginia area. They have the most physicians, they have the most locations. And I would say Boston IVF, I don't know that I would say owns the Boston area, but we have a, a, a bigger than a, a majority share. Uh, we have 15 satellite locations. We have over 20 doctors. So we have a ge- in that geography, just like Shady Grove does in their geography, I would say we're the, the, the large center and we are able to have those economies of scale from a geographic standpoint. Whereas to your point, if you're in a, you know, kind of a smaller fish in a big pond, that could be very, very good from a profitability standpoint, from a revenue generating standpoint, 
but you're never going to, you can be part of a very, very big group, but you're not going to own that geography because there's so much more competition. So tell, I, I'm making a note of, of that so we can talk about like what, what a company like Boston IVF that does have a lot of uh, market share in one area when you go into a new market, what that's like. But I'm making a note of that because I want to stay on the limited partners of each of these funds for a little bit of what they need for a successful return and what that means for potential practices. Actually, this is why I asked you to be on the podcast, David, because when we were doing the q and I already asked you one question. I was like, ah, I want this one answered. And so I got, <laughs> got to get David on the podcast so I can have so I can have more time and have him answer this question. But I was reading a book by Rand Fishkin, who owned a very uh, a, a, a successful software as a service company uh, called Moz, and they they help people uh, with SEO and digital marketing. And you know, they're probably like a $25, $50 million company, something like that um, at this point. In, they're in Seattle. Uh, they got their VC funders early on. Um, and what Rand Fishkin talks about in his book, Lost and Founder, is that there is a dis there's a, a disalignment between what the limited partners need and what the founding with the founders of the company might need to exit. And so he says, you know, if I'll just use round numbers, you get 10 people uh, or your 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 limited partners invest in a fund that is going to invest in 10 companies. They put a hundred million dollars into it, but they need, uh, you know, half a billion or a billion out of it. Then, if one company says like, "Oh, we, you know, we we started at five and we could exit now for twenty five, that's in the interest of the founders. We could five x and um, and we're ready to be done with this." But the limited partners see that, or the the VC firm sees what they need to deliver for the limited partners and says, "Well, if we let you out for twenty five, then we're only, you know, then we're ten percent not likely to reach." You know, we're that much less likely to reach our one billion mark, and so uh, so they have them hold on, and and maybe they are able to grow to that unicorn status, and maybe they're not. Does that first question is that uh, does is that a have you experienced that? Second, is that also present in private equity? I think Griffin, um, what I learned in researching. For the presentation at the at the Midwest Reproductive Society, I, I read several books and online articles about private equity, and I really educated myself. And I, quite honestly, I was shocked uh, by what I learned because, like you said, a private equity has limited partners, and the limited partners are the ones that are funding it. The actual um, financial sponsors, who essentially own the private equity company, put very little bit of their money in. They're putting maybe 10% of their own money in, and they're getting 90% from outside investors, those limited partners. Um, and then part of the way the mechanism works is when they buy a company, and you see this happening in the market today, the headlines for KKR, who's trying to uh, raise $800 million dollars. Uh, to offset the cost of buying EVRMA, they're going to an outside fund, a, a bank or a credit, private credit, to take that money and to offset some of the costs that they're using to buy it. Now, the debt to service that loan is borne by the individual company, not by the investors and not by the private equity. So if you have, it's kind of like your mortgage. It's like if you're paying $2,000 a month for mortgage, um, the company bought you and you're still paying the mortgage out of out of your operating expense the, you hold the more, like like any like any uh moron with uh with a spouse that lets them talk you know getting divorced something lets them talk them into uh uh well uh i, I gotta take you off the teeth but stay on the mortgage with me it's kind of like that yeah right <laughs> I need your income to be on the mortgage so I qualify, but you're not going to be on the deed. <laughs> right. Um, it's it's uh, it's really like so. It kind of blew my mind some of the way that the financials work here because uh, there's not a lot of money at risk for for the initial uh, financial sponsors. The investors are the ones that are at risk, 
And then when they buy the company, they saddle the company with debt and then they charge fees. So they'll charge management fees to the company. And if a board member goes out to visit, if the management goes out to visit, they're charging that company for the visit. They're charging the company for like you take the doctors out to dinner and guess what? They're going to charge the company back for that dinner. They're not spending their own money to do that. So the doctors are basically buying themselves dinner. Um, and uh, it gets worse than that because uh, they're not just doing that, but but they're actually the due diligence and the legal fees. This was also mind blowing to me. When we go in and we purchase a practice, we hire lawyers to, to write up the contracts. We hire a, a financial firm to look at the, make sure that the billing and everything is secure. We bear that cost ourselves. Private equity charges that back after the deal is done to that company. And so they're basically not putting, again, any of their money at risk. Um, and they're pulling money out of the organization. So the limited partner needs that return. And, and you're right, there is a basic period of time where they can get that return. If they don't get the return, typically what happens is they can recapitalize and the financial sponsors, the private equity sell, you know, they get their money back. The investors, if they don't flip it for what they, you know, expect it to, it's the investors that are ones losing out, not the private equity. So I want to talk about how the Boston IVF model differs from that, but I'm wondering if you can speak to how this dynamic impacts younger docs buying in. And there's a camp of people that say that really the only people that this benefits is the doctors who have built the practice that are within three years or so of retirement, and this is their exit, and that uh, the younger docs do not have the opportunity to to build that equity for themselves. I've also heard the the contra- you know, there's a doc that I really respect that I was having lunch with at PCRS that um, that has sold recently who said this benefits the younger docs the most because they have the opportunity to buy into something that's bigger. The private equity group is going to to sell and then they have the opportunity to uh, to be a part of that. And so um, the, where do you think, what's the truth? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I think the truth is in the eye of the beholder. Honestly, I I believe the reason why all this is happening. I, I think there's a perfect storm going on, and one of the one of the perfect storms is the physicians that founded the practices are entrepreneurs. Uh, I mean, I I've been in this field for for 28 years, and um, the amount of growth that's happened in IVF is is fantastic, and the physicians like. Michael Alper, who's who's one of the founders of Boston IVF, when they started Boston IVF 35 years ago, they left the hospital and started a private practice. It was one of the first private IVF centers in the United States. Michael Levy, uh, Art Sagaskin, who I did the same thing. They left, they started Shady Grove. They took a lot of risk and they didn't know that it was going to grow to what Boston IVF is today and Shady Grove is today. So the physicians that were the entrepreneurs that started these practices and grew them, why shouldn't they be allowed to sell and make a return on that investment? They've put 20, 30 years of their lives into building something. And I don't think anybody should say, no, that's not fair. You can't do this. What's happened is because these companies, the IVF centers have become so big that a a new doctor coming out might have loans, they might have student loans, and how can they afford to buy in if the buy-in is a million dollars or $2 million? Where can they come up with the funds to do that? I mean, one option- Is that what you call, is that what you call trapped equity? Yeah, exactly. And okay, and so you said what you were talking, you were starting to talk about the options. Let's say, let's say a three physician practice is generating $7 million of revenue a year, and let's say they're they're generating $2 million of profit. Um, and, and those three doctors founded the practice. If they want to sell, one of them wants to retire, either the other two partners have to buy them out and come up with whatever the multiple is, two, three years. So let's say it's three years of profit, that's 6 million. So the third owner gets $2 million. So the other two doctors each have to come up with a million dollars to buy that doctor out. or 
a new doctor coming in has to come up with $2 million. How do they come up with $2 million to buy that doctor out of the practice? That's the trapped equity. A private equity can come in and say, hey, we're not going to give you three years of profit. We're going to give you seven years of profit. And we'll give you even more for that equity that you have that's trapped in your practice. And that's exactly why private equity is seen as a very good deal for the founding doctors, because it's a way for them to recoup uh, and to be rewarded for all the blood and sweat that they've put into building that practice. So So I would never begrudge them from, from doing that. No, nor would I. But at, at the end of the day, it's 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 someone's business, uh, and it is hard work to build a business. So um, the question is, the question I'm hoping to to learn more about is, is it beneficial to the younger doctors? But you talk about how this is often advantaged be, for the physicians because uh, the private equity uh, is. Or it's it's advantage to sell to private equity upon exit or nearing exit because they can give more than the uh, potential partners uh, who might have to put in a million dollars. Right, or but, so but there also might be there might be a catch, and that's why I think it's important to understand the contracts. Well, that's why because, I want to ask about because wouldn't it have to be true in order for it, okay this private equity firm is is willing to give me more that I would have to get more upfront and have less in the earnout. Like it seems to me like that would have to be the case as opposed to because couldn't they do an owner finance deal with the younger docs and and they could pay them over time? They they could. And I think the question is different private equities have different models. So in some models, the person that is being bought out needs to reinvest. I, I was on a board of directors of a company that got bought out by private equity and the senior management had to roll some of that money that they got paid into into the new new vehicle, the new uh, private equity company. Um, so that's not unusual. That let's say the doctor gets bought out, but they have to put in twenty or thirty percent of that money into the current you know business, and then we'll get an earnout at the end when the private equity flips. The question is, will the private equity flip? And if they don't flip at the multiple, because they're targets, if you don't hit your target then you don't get you know, that money back. That money is sunk, it's lost. It's just like the investors. You put money in, they didn't hit the targets. Sorry, but you're never gonna get that additional 30% that you thought you were gonna get. And so that's where there have already been cases where physicians expected to get a quote, a second bite of the apple or another bump and the private equity didn't hit their targets. And so the physicians, not only do they not get money, but sometimes there's a clawback provision that the doctor has to give some of that upfront money back because the private equity didn't make the profit targets that they were supposed to make. Is that sometimes phased? So, you know, for example, we're looking at a profit sharing plan that accounts for, okay, if, if, if you don't make this profit threshold in Q1, you can make it back in Q2 uh, and you, you can make it back for Q1. You can make for for the rest of the year. So is it ever phased or is it typically in one window? And if that one window isn't reached, then there isn't the opportunity to... Uh, the, yeah. the simple answer to that is it could be both, but I'll give you a real world example. My wife's best friend is an OBGYN who was bought out by a private equity in December. She does not, she was given a term sheet. She's never seen her contract. She's never seen what her targets are and all 40 of the OBGYNs are below their targets. But the company that bought them hasn't actually showed them what their targets are. They just tell them that you're not achieving your targets. So there's not a lot of transparency there. And that's a real world example that that just happened, not in reproductive health, but in OBGYN. And I think that happens a lot. You know, people are, are kind of lured by the shiny object of, hey, here's all the money up front but then they don't necessarily get the clarity on, well, what are the targets I'm gonna have to hit? And are they realistic targets? I've seen pitch books from investment bankers where they're projecting three-year growth rates, which are totally unattainable. And honestly, I would say fraudulent. There is no way that you can grow a top line revenue by 20% and your profit by 100%. You run a business, Griffin, 
There's no way that you can bring in 20% more top line, but expect to, you know, unless you're going to cut, you know, all, all of your staff and be a one man show, it just isn't realistic. And yet some of these investment bankers show these pitch decks and they, you know, show, oh, look at IVF, it's growing at double digits and we're going to be able to grow this. And really, I think now with the pending recession, a lot of those private equities might be sitting here in a year and saying, wait, what happened to this growth that the investment bankers promised me? So you, people are pitching things that often include a window for achieving goals that perhaps from the pitch book from the very beginning might be a completely unattainable projection. So why uh, why aren't doctors, maybe they are in some cases, I, they are in a couple cases. Why isn't it more common to see doctors say, okay, we'll do an owner finance deal for the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do an owner finance deal for the for, practice. For the people, people do that in, people do that in real estate. Sometimes they'll say like, if they don't want to get hit with a capital gains tax, for example, yep. they'll say, okay, I'm your bank and the equity of the house is what your is is how I'm financing this and you are paying me and you can write it up in such a way that if they default on payments and, and maybe it's more complicated than that, but you can write it up in such a way that if they default on payments or if they sell that, you know, I think that was, I, I, I think that was probably more of the case before private equity became involved because that was the option. And basically, I mean, you're, you're writing a promissory note you're loaning somebody money and they're paying you back every year a certain amount or every quarter. So that that's done, but it's, you know, you're at risk, right? Um, I, I think it's a very good way to do it, but if someone is knocking on your door and quite frankly, look, every doctor that you talk to, every doctor that I've talked to has been approached by multiple companies, private equities, other people wanting to buy their business, throwing out these huge dollar amounts, and so it becomes a, a fact of, do I get the money from the private equity like this, or do I do a five-year deal with my you know, associate physician so they can buy in and I retire in, in five years? Maybe that works for some people, but it's not going to be at the same dollar figure as they're going to be offered by an external company. I promise I will figure out this sponsorship scheme for Inside Reproductive Health so that we can get people on advertising, sharing their content without it being an endorsement from me, because there are so few companies, there might be one or two other companies that I would give an endorsement to, but so far it has just been Engaged MD. And the reason is I'm just not qualified to be able to talk about a certain company's performance. It would have, they have, it would have to be so disproportionately positive. And that for me has been engaged MD. I have more than half of my clients that have used engaged MD. Every single one of them loves it. Many of them have started after we begin working with them. And they and every other person that I've ever spoken to that is a user of Engaged MD talks about how much time and grief it saves their nurses and their staff, that they don't have to do the same things over and over again. They have a much more scalable and efficient platform for educating patients, building that rapport. So then when the nurse or the clinician talks to the patient, they're able to tailor that conversation to what the patient actually needs and not repeating the same things to someone that's a deer in headlights. I keep hearing how much time engaged MD is saving fertility staff, keep hearing how much stress it's saving them at a time when burnout is still crazy. People are still leaving positions left and right when in my view, they shouldn't be. We still lack a lot of technology logical solutions that I hope we have in the next five, 10 years. But EngageMD is one that is here now. And more than half of the practices in North America are using EngagedMD. So I hope that you are in that group. But if you're not, if you're still in the now on the laggard side of the bell curve, then I hope that you go to EngagedMD.com slash Griffin and they're going to give you a free workflow assessment. You're going to be able to see what other clinics, you're going to get some insights from how other clinics have things structured. And you're going to see a couple 
major areas that you can prove to keep your team from burning out, to keep them from stress. That's free as long as you mention my name and the podcast. And I ask that you share that with them anyway, because it's one of the things that helps give free content to you and to all of the listeners. But the real beneficiary is your team and your patients, because patients have a much better experience when they can be better educated, when they can do things on their time, and then they can have what needs to be tailor fit to them, truly personalized care. And so the real beneficiaries are staff and patients do it for them, not me, but it's nice to help out the podcast and get yourself a free workflow assessment by going to engagemd.com slash Griffin. And now back to the show. So what could be the advantages for younger docs then? Do you see that prospect that, yeah, like we, we could buy into something much bigger and, uh, and the private equity group can help us finance it. And then we can sell to the next private equity group when that, uh, when, when they sell in three to seven years, uh, do, is there, I, would say in theory, I think in theory, it sounds good. Um, you are buying into a, if they let you buy into a network, I mean, there's always a question of, are you buying it at a local level or are you buying it at a national level, um, at, or at a network level? A lot of these groups don't let you buy in at the, at the higher level, unless you're one of the, you know, senior doctors. So again, as a junior, as an associate doctor, who is not a current owner, you might be able to buy in locally at the you know, profit that's being done locally, but I don't know if you have the opportunity to buy in at a network scale. Um, and so that's something that you know, may, may be, but I, I'm thinking oftentimes that's not the case, that you could buy in locally. And yeah, there is a benefit that if it flips, but if you look at the history in dermatology, in dentistry, um, in LASIK, a lot of more of these companies have actually gone bankrupt uh, than have actually sold for huge multiples and everybody walks away with fat checks. So unfortunately, it's a lot of the nurses and the doctors that end up having to pick the pieces off of the ground because the parent company went bankrupt and they're left without jobs or they now have to start a new business and try to find financing to, to build a business themselves. Um, that's more the case in healthcare where private equity has been in for the last eight to 10 years. That what and, happened and, with the IntegraMed situation? Uh, that's yeah, IntegraMed, I think IntegraMed was honestly just bad timing, but you had Laura Katz Olson on your show and she wrote this book ethically challenged about private equity in healthcare. And she has numerous examples from all these other healthcare industries where one after the other has gone bankrupt the doctors are interviewed and they say, I made the biggest mistake. I didn't realize this. So I think one of the things that's important for reproductive endocrinology, this is a new field for private equity. Doctors should just be looking at and talking to uh, other physicians that have sold to that private equity that's trying to woo them and find out what their experience was. What is, has it been? What's the track record? You know, Are there fees that are being charged? Are, have they ridden the company with debt? Just talk to other groups that have already gone through it with that same private equity to find out. Um, I, I think I think that's you know that's kind of the doing dil doing diligence on the physician side that they should be doing. Sometimes they're worried about the NDAs, the people that are in those deals, especially the people that are unhappy. They're worried about uh, will I be in violation of my NDA if if this person calling me asking me how my experience would work. But I but. But then again, some others aren't. I guess they're. Yeah, I think they, they won't go on the record. But I've, it seems to me like many of them will talk to another physician, especially if it's I in think person. Kind especially of, yeah, they'll, if they'll, there's a they'll beverage, warn, they'll warn them. Um, in this book, there was a reproductive endocrinology practice that was interviewed, and one of the physicians is still there and very bluntly said, "I mean, his name is is in the book," and he says they cut our nurses. They replace them with medical assistants who were not trained. They don't let us buy supplies. When something is old, we used to replace it when we were when we owned the practice ourselves. Now we're told make do with what you have. So, you know, physicians, I think the real other aspect of this is a lot of the physicians are used to being their own bosses. 
They built the practice, they decide what they want to do. And now they have a business person who's telling them what to do. And that's another important question is who makes the decision? Is it a business decision or is it a clinical medical decision? And not often, you know, in what I've read, a lot of times the decisions are made purely on a business rationale for profit, not on uh, what's right for the patient or what's right medically. So it's not immediately obvious to me where business operations and in clinical operations begin. I don't think it's like a completely, yeah, there's not like a, a, a supremely thick line always. And sometimes uh, it seems like there's overlap and you use the example of ultrasound. I've used that example before, but you said you know, like in the state that we're in, what, what insurance reimburses for, we can't afford to have a doc using uh, or doing ultrasounds. We have text for that. And some docs would listen to that, Dave, and say, that's a business person telling me how I can practice because of business considerations. It's, it's a, well, I would argue actually that a ultrasonographer who has Credited, accreditation in ultrasonography, it's probably, and the doctors will, you know, our doctors admit that they can do a much better ultrasound than the physician can because they're trained and that's what they do. And a lot of, you know, we have ultrasonographers that are per diem where they'll work in a hospital doing ultrasounds and they'll come, you know, a couple of days for us and do them. So they're more uh, efficient and they're trained, even though they're getting paid less. Uh, they're more of a specialist than a physician is who's doing ultrasounds. You could be a hundred percent right about that, but there are still physicians that want to do it. And oh, uh, yeah, and and you know one of the important things. It sounds a little corny, um, but the Boston IVF, our model is we want to do what's right for the patient first and foremost. So we believe, and and this is instilled because the physicians founded the practice. And I'm not a physician; I'm an MBA, but I can tell you. I don't miss with a lab. I don't miss with the physicians um, because those are the two most important assets that we have in our company. And I'm never going to tell an embryologist if they want to use a certain media and they want to use a certain microscope or an incubator because they get better success rates. It's in my interest as a business person to make sure we get the best success rates that we can because our patients are going to be happy. Our referring physicians are going to be happy. Everybody's going to be happy. So I'm not going to cut corners and say, hey, I got a great deal on this media, you know, from ABC Media Factory, and it's not the same quality as Irvine or Cooper, but you got to use it because we're saving money. Same thing with catheters. We have physicians that choose different catheters. We don't have one catheter. We let the physician who's doing the transfer use the catheter they feel comfortable with. It costs us more, but the physician feels like they're doing a better transfer and they're more comfortable doing it. So who am I as a business person to tell a physician how to practice or an embryologist how to practice? But even if it's the partner physicians, the most senior partner physicians that say, you know what? Uh, I use this catheter. I use, I use catheter C all the time. It's cheaper than catheter B and I use it all the time and it works great. So everybody else is using catheter B because it's cheaper and I think it's good. Isn't that still a business decision made for the rest of the group when when things like that happen or in the case of ultrasounds like okay i'm the founding physician i've been uh, and my part my senior partners agree with me uh and we don't think we we believe that a ultrasound tech can do a much better job than a physician and we uh can't afford to do it isn't that still a business decision that the that the, the like it's still it's a, where it's business a business happens. yes it's a business decision but it's being made by the clinician and, and I think the clinician is the one who determines whether it will have an impact on the patient or whether they'll have an impact on their success rates. And at the end of the day, the patients are coming to a practice and they're, whether it's insurance or a patient paying, they're paying to get pregnant. They're paying to have a baby. So if the clinician, the you know, senior physician has made that determination, they feel that it is maybe a business decision, but the practice medically is not going to suffer. I'm not, I, I'm not qualified to make that decision, but absolutely a physician, if Michael Alper, who our medical director makes a decision from his medical director, he's, he's the one who's the clinician that's making the decision. So I think, because- I think that's something that physicians need to take into account too, that I, I, 
that it can be other physicians. They don't always agree on, as oh, we no, know. No. Uh, well, and so, so one of the things, you know, one of the things that's unique when I was, uh, when I was on the industry side, I ran the U.S. for, for EMD Serono. I ran global for Merck Serono. I've been in my 28 plus years, probably 75% of IVF centers in the United States. There's a handful of IVF centers that actually look at key performance indicators, KPIs. Now, private equity is that's one of the benefits. They'll look at these KPIs. But one of the things that we do at Boston IVF is we blind the physicians, but we'll look at transfer rates. We'll look at pregnancy per transfer by physician with a blinded letter for each physician. And we'll be able to see how everybody stacks up. And if people fall below a, a standard deviation, we have that doctor go work with somebody who is above a standard deviation to get retrained. Um, and it's done, you know, in, in, a, in a very respectful way. Nobody's name is in front of anybody. Nobody knows who the poor performing ones are. But we look at this and we try to then make, uh, re- whether it's training or, or other ways, like we might have one of the top physicians in our grand rounds do a 30 minute talk on how do they do an embryo transfer? What are, what are their kind of secrets so that everybody learns and improves? But you're absolutely right. You know, physicians will all have different opinions. Um, and that's where the data, collecting the data, looking at the data on a regular basis, it's hard to argue with the data. Every physician always wants to see, uh, uh, you know, double blind, randomized controlled trial because you can't argue with that data. It's the same thing if you have key performance indicators. Oh, well, the prioritization of those key performance indicators adds another variable. But let's talk about the Boston IVF model, because uh, that was a question. That was the question I did have for you at MRS, which is, I said, OK, David, like there's all the there's these uh, considerations for private equity. But uh, Boston IVF was acquired by a company that is uh, traded on the European stock market. Um, and so which of these considerations also apply to your model? And you gave your answer and I'll allow you to give your answer here. Boston. So let me just give you a, a little bit of a correction because Boston IVF is majority owned by Eugen Group. Eugen is a, a Spanish IVF group with IVF centers in Europe, South America, uh, North America, where Boston IVF is in the United States. They just uh, acquired Trio in Toronto. Um, but besides EV RMA, probably the largest global IVF group. Um, and they were acquired in uh, 20, uh, April of 21 by Fresenius Medical. And we fall, Eugen falls under the Helios Healthcare Group in Fresenius. Fresenius is a $29 billion uh, market value company. Uh, they own a private group of hospitals, the largest group of private hospitals in Germany and Spain. And so the IVF group falls within that. So in their medical in their medical group. Our model is we're strategic. Eugen only does IVF. Eugen doesn't have OBGYN or dermatology or anything like that. They just focus on IVF worldwide. Boston IVF, we only do IVF. So we're strategic. Um, there are other groups in the U.S. like that as well that are strategic, but we're what we would consider a strategic acquirer. We don't have other healthcare businesses or non-healthcare businesses in our group. We're just doing IVF. Because we've been doing IVF for 35 years, we're physician run uh, with a management team. We make clinical decisions based on what I just said, um, the best interest of the patient. And for the 35 year history of Boston IVF, uh, the mindset has been do what's right for the patient and the money will follow. And so that's our philosophy. That's also Eugen is very hands off. They are obviously there are targets that we have financially, but they never burden a doctor with that. Um, As the CEO of the Boston IVF network, yeah, I have targets that I have to meet. And when I don't meet those targets, I've got to explain why we haven't met them. But we're not looking at, we're looking at realistic growth. We're not looking at doubling. We're looking at what will the market grow at? What will we think is reasonable? And we set our own targets. Um, And it's like any other business. When we set a target, 
we're expected to achieve on that target, but we're not going and saying we've got to grow at a 50% rate in one year. We have realistic targets. What we also do is we see ourselves more as a physician partner. We're going to come in as a partner and it's very, it's a very simple model. We don't have holdbacks. You don't have to buy stock in Boston IVF. When someone partners with Boston IVF, there's an agreed upon price, they receive cash, and in return, we receive a piece of the business. Every year, the profit is taken and distributed based on ownership. So if we owned 60% of an IVF center, when the profit is distributed, we get 60% of that and the physician owners get 40%. And every year we distribute it based on that percent ownership. We don't do it based on, oh, you didn't meet your target, so we're gonna hold money back or their private equities that sometimes you don't get profit distribution until they flip. So even though it's accruing in a bank, you don't get it until they actually sell the company three to seven years down the road. And then you get it you know, based on what you achieved. So we feel like we have a simple model. Um, we don't come in and we don't tell people how to practice medicine. For our partner groups in Utah and Ohio and Delaware, we don't come in and change a lot. If they want our help, we'll be happy to do that. We do have data analytics. So we have a team of data analysts that will help them uh, look at their data and, and look at key performance indicators. We've got a group of marketers. Uh, we do a lot of social media. Uh, most of the groups that we partner with have never done marketing. Um, and so we are able to provide that service as well. And we don't charge management fees. So what we do, if there's a cost in the social media, if there's a cost in the website, yeah, they have to pay for that website, but we're not charging them for our time. So um, the part that I think that I'm missing is why don't you have that, uh, oh, I don't, I don't, whatever, the obligation isn't the right word to Eugen, but you know where, where they are expecting a certain level of returns, because why buy a company if you're not involved in the growth if you're not expecting a certain you know certain metrics for growth we we absolutely are looking for growth uh but we're not looking for growth in a year or two eugen is not going to sell for Zenius is you know i i, I would hope that they're not going to flip they the difference between private equity is they have a period of time where it's you know this is what they do three to five years seven years they flip for Zenius is not looking to flip eugen Eugen is not looking to flip Boston IVF. And so for that reason, we don't have time sensitive growth goals. We're in it for the long run. And so we expect that, yeah, there will be growth. And we think some of the growth that we can do, Boston IVF has a hub and spoke model. We know how to grow practices. We've built de novo practices in Syracuse. We're opening one right now in Wilmington, North Carolina. We opened a new IVF center in New Hampshire and we're building one in Providence. So we can do this to help. When we, when we partnered with Ohio Reproductive Medicine in Columbus, we built them a brand new 17,000 square foot IVF center where because of our knowledge of how to design a lab and build a practice, we built that office. We didn't charge them a dime. But we expect that there'll be growth because now there's room to do more cycles. We're looking at expanding, maybe bringing additional doctors in. And so all of that over time will benefit us on a growth, but we're not looking to get it back in three years. And that's one of the biggest differences is the longer term time frame. When you buy into a practice somewhere, do you borrow money from Eugen to do that? We do. So Eugen, Eugen funds our growth internally. They don't go out and saddle debt on the practice. The practice doesn't have to pay it off. Um, so Boston IVF pays it based on the profits. Uh, so, so we're I, able to get- Finance able is to my weakest part. So talk to me a little bit how this is different from servicing debt that you would borrow and have interest on. Because the biggest difference is we don't put the debt, if we're borrowing money from our internal, we're not charging Ohio Reproductive Medicine for that money. It's coming out of the profit that the bigger organization is getting. So we're not saying to ORM, hey, we just took out, let's say, X millions of dollars. You've got to pay back that loan for us. No, we don't do that. We pay back the loan ourselves. I want to talk about 
uh, whether it's this uh, actually with this model for younger docs can when can somebody buy in as a as a doc at boston ivf i just got out of fellowship i'm going to work for boston ivf in in new hampshire or wherever let, let me give you let me two two examples when we acquired reproductive care center in salt lake city utah one of our former fellows christy moss came in and bought in and became a partner day one so she moved from san diego to salt lake we did the acquisition and she bought in and she is a partner there. Uh, two additional physicians in Delaware, when we acquired Jeff Russell's practice, two physicians, Amelia Bachman and George Kowalewski, bought in day one and they're now owners of that practice. Um, so in those two situations- Well, that's for the one, existing practices. So that's like if I buy a house and I'm like, all right, well, I'll go in with you and you'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get, uh, well, you don't buy fifty percent of our house. Well, we're all right. We're buying a business. So we're buying, yeah. a, you know, we're, yeah. we're buying sixty percent of the business. So we'll get fifty. You get ten. Like right. uh, so. But what about like? But they know, didn't have the opportunity to do that. So we absolutely helped. no. It's a great opportunity for them. But what about right. the people that are just like coming to work for Boston IVF and it's not a, a like an individual practice? Like how do they buy in? So we have a we have a partnership track. Um, if there's a time period, so there are a couple of components, but there's a time period involved. And basically the way we work it is exactly what you were saying. Boston IVF acts as a bank and we provide the physician that wants to buy in with financing over a period of time. We try to model it so that they get an increase in salary, they get a, a profit distribution and their payoff every year would be more than covered based on their profit distribution and, and their growth. How it for the you said that some folks can buy like for other networks they can buy in maybe at the at the group level but not the network level when somebody's buying into a you know when Boston IVF you know, acquires a uh, a practice in in Smithtown USA uh, is that person that and you have to bring in an REI and so and they're becoming a partner from day one is are they just uh, a partner in the Smithtown practice or are they also a partner in Boston IVF? So everything is localized. And I think that's another advantage of our model. If Utah performs very, very well and Ohio doesn't, Ohio or Utah is not saddled with the loss in Ohio. Utah is its own entity. So they're responsible for their own. If they do great, they share in those profits. If they don't do well, they're insulated. And another practice that's doing good in our network isn't affected by a practice that's not doing well. So I think there's a lot of security in that. So the answer to your question is if someone's buying in, they can buy in at a local level, or if they wanna buy in at a higher level, they can, but we don't force them to. So it's entirely up to them if they wanna buy in locally or if they wanna buy in at the network. While we're talking about uh, younger physicians, I read a paper from Yale that talked about the benefits of buy and hold businesses, just like just like the, the stock market, the, the, the buy and hold strategy is often better than the flip strategy. They cited a couple things. Um, one is you know, the equity that you're building yourself, the compounding that comes from that, uh, the, the you know, capital gains and any other taxes that can come from selling redeployment risk if you sell and and maybe you're not as successful at the next venture. Uh, so they made the case for, Start a business, invest in that business, and hold it your own damn self until you're ready to to not do it anymore. And so, are are younger docs losing out by not doing that as much? And because they're coming out saddled with debt, because practices are more expensive, but are they are they losing out by because they're not creating a business for themselves? putting in that sweat, sweat equity, them getting the other partners, them making the efficiency and then, and owning, you know, a hundred percent of it or eventually until they sell to their other partner, are they, are they missing out by not doing that? I think they could be absolutely. I, I mean, look at yourself as, as an example, you know, you build a business, you're growing it obviously, and you're going to reap the benefits from that. Uh, I look at spring fertility. Peter Klatsky is a great example. You know, he got out, he started a business and he's growing and he's doing a phenomenal job of growing that. So yeah, I think the benefit of what you're saying is you're investing in yourself. 
and you are going to be, you know, either successful or detrimental, but it's your sweat equity. And as a, I would much rather bet on myself because I have control and I know if I want to work hard, I'm going to go see, you know, all these patients. Um, I, and and uh, I think one of the, one of the challenges of a model when private equity is buying out a physician and you lose that incentive for the physician to have control over their own ability to grow, I would be concerned from a private equity. Uh, we think physician ownership in Eugen is very important. Physician, so Eugen's model is never to buy 100%. We don't want doctors as employees. We want doctors as partners. And so that's a big difference. And I personally agree with you. My wife and I has a side business in real estate. This is for, for another podcast. Maybe you'll do it at some point. But um, you know, we've we've bought real estate, held it over many many years, and then reap the benefit of selling uh, as that you know as, as that value has accumulated. So that it might still for for those that are called to do it it might make sense i i think one of the reasons why it's not happening more david is that you talked about you, you mentioned that you know, these doctors that that founded are were entrepreneurs and i tend to argue that a little bit yeah you know, i had dr arredondo on the show who just wrote a book called medicalpreneur and i think in many cases they're not entrepreneurs that they that that many of the people that founded IVF practice they're just not entrepreneurs in the, in the real sense of the word that I agree with Andrew Meikle when he says a barber is not somebody that owns a barber shop is and works as a barber there is not an entrepreneur they're a small business owner and that's fine but a, the entrepreneur is the person that goes out and opens 20 barber shops yeah, and yeah. and I, I agree with that and I think that there's a lot of people that inherited a model I wrote this article in 2018, and of all the articles that I wrote, that I'm like, oh, I wrote, do, do I do I even still think that way? I read that article, I'm like, yeah, I still feel that that's true. That that many practice founders in the 90s or so inherited a model that was more or less the same as a the general practitioners model from the mid 20th century. They made money and did well because they have a trade that is highly in demand. And because their trade is so in demand that it allows you to not, you don't have to be perfect in every area of business when you are that in demand. And it allows for a lot of error that many other businesses, uh, they, they have to get better at. And that because of that, I think that there's a lot of people that started practices then that weren't entrepreneurs, but now entrepreneurs are in the space, whether it's Eugen and Shady Grove and the Michael Alpers and the Michael Levy's and the TJ Farnsworth and all uh, Kind Body and G everybody. Entrepreneurs are here now. And it's like saying, yeah, I was a professional football player in the 50s versus I have a professional player in 2020 with Patrick Mahomes and and uh, Arnold and uh, and everybody else in the hello in the Josh game. Allen come on yeah yeah Josh Allen I didn't want to I already just gave him a plug recently but you know uh, you know Aaron Donald and everybody else and so um, it's like yeah a couple of those guys and you mentioned some of them could have played in the league in the in the yeah. could play in the league from the fifties could have played in the league as, as met as some of those folks in the eighties and nineties truly were entrepreneurs. And, and some of them are still here now, but it's, there is that level of difference. So um, I, I agree a hundred percent with you, um, Griffin. And, and, you know, thinking about it, um, I, I would all, I would add in Bill Schoolcraft and, and Richard Scott and Alan Copperman, you know, these are, are people that are incredibly bright, gifted physicians who have changed the way we practice medicine in reproductive endocrinology. And so you can have both a business entrepreneur or you can have a scientific entrepreneur. And uh, yeah, th then there's a lot of people, it's like anything else. You have the early adopters and you have the people that are kind of driving forward. And then you have everybody else who's just kind of like, hey, yeah, that looks good. And a lot of medicine is about, oh, I don't wanna try it until somebody else does it and shows that it works. Um, so I, I think you make a very, very good analogy. Um, I think there's also an aspect where I've, I've heard this from, from many physicians, and I think this is true when they were in residency, when they were in fellowship, 
when they were coming out, they worked weekends, you know, they worked late. And today, physicians coming out are saying, hey, I want to have a work life balance. Uh, I want to work three days a week or four days a week. We, we have physicians that come in and say, I've got a young family. I want to spend my weekends with the family. I don't want to take call. And hey, that's great. Good luck in a practice that might let you do that. But there aren't a lot of practices out there. I mean, you're, you're kind of coming into a field where you've got to be available when the patient's needed. We do 365 days uh, a, a year. We're doing retrievals on Saturday and Sunday. And if you don't want to take call on the weekend and you don't want to do like, maybe this isn't the best practice for you. So there's a maybe a little bit of a difference of people's mentality of what they're looking for and maybe a little bit of an old school, hey, um, you know, you got to you got to put in a lot of time. You got to work really hard. I mean, it's like anybody starting a business when you're starting a business you know, you're working 24 seven, you're not taking vacation, you got to get this thing off the ground, because it's got to be successful. Uh, with regard to that, I know that I'm, I pissed a bunch of people off by saying that. And uh, I, I am not dismissing what people have accomplished. I know that and, and have them will probably be my clients. But they're, you know, I, if you built a group, and you've had a successful practice, uh, that that's a tremendous accomplishment. I'm making the distinction between small business owner or practice owner and entrepreneur. And I don't even put myself in the entrepreneur category yet, David. I don't think I've earned it. I think entrepreneurs are faster. They put capital at mm -hmm. risk more. Whereas I will tend to, as opposed to putting capital at risk, for example, I'll, I will stay in and do things myself for a little while and then we can afford to do it and, and, and then hire more people. So like, I feel that I'm expanding on the entrepreneurial spectrum. If Elon Musk is a hundred and someone that never does any kind of venture is a zero, probably, you know, I'm probably like sixties. I don't know, but, and I, and I, and I'm moving towards that, but I don't think that I'm there yet. I think real entrepreneurs, uh, are the ones that they start companies. They put these entire systems at place. And many people are practitioners that have been able to have successful practice. And that there's something to be said for that too. You can live a nice life like that. And, oh, and maybe, and and, maybe and it's the life of, that you want a lot more than the other one too. But a lot of entrepreneurs also have a different way of looking at things. And so they have an idea that might differentiate. And then they have the, I mean, a lot of people have great ideas. But the entrepreneur is the one that puts into practice, steps on the gas, you know, and ignites it so that it really becomes something. So I want to let you conclude how you want to conclude. But before that, I do want you to look into the David Stern crystal ball that you don't have. None of us can predict the future of the economy, but you mentioned the recession. I've been preparing for recession since the last one, man. I started my career in 07. I'm from Buffalo. I'm always ready for a recession, David. My whole <laughs> company is built on being ready for. And I thought I said in 2014, I was like, this feels a lot like 2007. I've said it every year since then, and I've been wrong. And uh, and so. It, it might not happen now. What do you think is going to happen? And what do you think that means for the fertility field? I think we're absolutely headed into a recession. You look at the stock market, you look at it, the inflation, um, the U.S. economically. It's not just the U.S. It, it's it's everywhere. I mean, I was just at the Esri meeting in Milan. The euro and the dollar are right at the same price. It hasn't happened in 20 years. So the globe, there's a global recession that's happening um, you know, you could argue is it the war in the Ukraine and, and Russia and oil and all these different things. But I, I think over the next, I think it's going to be bumpy. The next 12 to 18 months is going to be bumpy in the United States. What does that mean for IVF? When you're in a mandated state, if you have the employer carve outs, I think that will still be important. I think it will be harder. I was just talking to someone right before I got on with you who's telling me on the West Coast, they're already hearing that doctors are feeling um, they're not seeing the growth that they saw in 21. It's come back more to flat. You know, they're not seeing the number of cycles, the number of new patients, their waiting lists aren't like what they were last year. So I think we're already starting to feel it and to see it. And in IVF, historically, it's the cash markets that see it a lot more. If you look at 2008 and 2009, I was running at the US for, for EMD Serono, and we saw really big 
um, hits in Texas, uh, Florida, uh, California in terms of volume. But in the managed care states in Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, we saw pretty much, you know, same four or five percent, you know, growth. Um, and, and so that's what I would expect. I, I don't think we're going to be seeing double digit growth that we've seen in 21. Uh, but I do think that um, th we're, we're, we're going to be hit in the next 12 to 18 months and we're going to see cycle volume drop. We've covered a lot of bases today. How would you like to conclude with regard to buying, selling, funding, and operating fertility practices? Well, Griffin, thank you so much uh, for having me. I, I enjoyed it. it. It seemed like it actually flew by. One of the things I, I would say the most important thing is when we're looking at an IVF center to partner with, we do due diligence. Um, and the most important thing is thinking about it in a medium to long term. When you're getting married, there used to be a great analogy. Uh, did you ever hear of Seth Godin, kind of a business author? Origi Purple originally from Buffalo, New York, it is oh. cue, cue ball head and, yes. and signature I'm a, glasses. I'm a, big, I'm a big Seth Godin fan. And Seth Godin used to talk about marketing. When you are dating somebody, and I know you're engaged, um, you married now, married now, oh, married. Right, two months in. Congratulations. So um, 20, 28 years. Um, when, you're, when you're dating someone, your first date is not about getting married. You have to date someone, see if it's a right fit, and then get married. And I think we approach it the same way. We want to date our practices that we're going to partner with, see if it's a good fit, see if the culture is right, see if we have you know, commonality. And an IVF center that's being approached by anybody, a strategic, a private equity, venture capital, whoever, should be doing the same kind of due diligence. Is there a cultural fit? Do you agree on what the midterm and long-term goals should be? Where do you see yourselves in five years? And having a very open discussion about what that looks like and, and talking about who makes the decision. Does business trump medicine or does medicine trump business? And those are important discussions to have before, you know, on those dates, um, before you get married. I, I was, you know, with COVID, we've gone out and it's very important. We go out and we do site visits. We want to look at the IVF center. We want to talk to the physicians. We sit down with them. I can't tell you the number of deals that we haven't won where the other party that wins has never set foot in an IVF center that they're buying. They've never met the physician face to face. It's all been on Zoom and they do a video tour. And if I'm spending that kind of money now, granted, when private equity is doing it, it's not their money, it's someone else's money. But it's kind of like going in to buy a house and doing it on a Zoom video and never walking in that house. That's kind of scary. Um, and so if a physician, if I'm a physician selling my practice and I never get to meet the person and they never come to see what my practice looks like. I would think long and hard about, are they the right partner for me? Yeah. Yeah. You're not, uh, it's, it's definitely, there's definitely missing something between that point in the date and marriage. Uh, but David, we're going to link to your LinkedIn in the show notes so that if people want to can have this conversation with you that they can thank you so much for coming on inside reproductive health. Griffin, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. Have a great afternoon. You've been listening to the Inside Reproductive Health Podcast with Griffin Jones. If you're ready to take action to make sure that your practice thrives beyond the revolutionary changes that are happening in our field and in society, visit fertilitybridge.com to begin the first piece of the fertility marketing system, the goal and competitive diagnostic. Thank you for listening to Inside Reproductive Health.